Javex and new fresh scent Javex with a fresh clean fragrance. Nothing can outperform my Javex. It's Fast Company with your shy and humble host, Alan Thick. Presenting a veritable array of unusually gifted and sometimes dangerous talent. Fast Company, playing host to the entertainment industry's hottest acts. Grab yourself a load of laughs and some Fast Company. I'm, I'm finished now. Fast Company, 7.30 Fridays on BCTV. BCTV. Morning. The Canadian labour movement has been scarred or blessed by actions which take place every now and again by international unions, generally American-based unions, who impose trusteeships on locals in British Columbia. Right now, there is a bit of a crisis for about 14,000 hotel and restaurant workers. Some of you may have followed the allegations of this, that and the next thing in Local 40, as a result of which Local 40 is under international trusteeship. And here to tell me about that is Jim Stamos, who is the International Vice President of the Hotel and Restaurant Workers, and Ron Bonner, the Acting Trustee of Local 40. And they are threatened by a Canadian union called CAMA, who want to raid them, want to get rid of them, think they're a bad union. And speaking for them this morning will be Peter Cameron, the Regional Vice President, I think it is, of CAMA, and Dave Matthews, a defector from Local 40, the man who started much of the current kerfuffle. We'll get into the details later. Now, also in the studio this morning, I've got the man who spies on the Mounties, Sawatsky. He has caused nothing but trouble for the force in many ways. Mind you, the force has been in trouble anyway, before, during and after the McDonald Report. Sawatsky has now put his reportorial eye on a man called Leslie James Bennett, who left the Canadian Security Service. Now, nobody's surprised by allegations of moles. The British intelligence service seems to have been riddled by the moles. The Americans have had their problems and allegations that we too in Canada have had our problems. Leslie James Bennett, James Bennett however, although he was removed from the Mounties, has been cleared, it would seem, according to Swatsky, of the allegations that he was a Russian mole in Canada's secret service. And then for the record this morning, I'm going to speak to Dr. Tim Johnson, the Provincial Director of Epidemiology. You remember the program I did the other day on vaccination, almost compulsory in Vancouver. And the subject I was raising about hepatitis B vaccine and if the right people are going to be protected or if the provincial government is being chintzy about its supplies of a new vaccine to protect health workers at risk from hepatitis B. First for the local 40 battle after the break. I'll tell you right now, I don't know where the truth lies in the allegations of financial mismanagement and even connection with organized crime that have been swirling around the hotel and restaurant workers union all these many months now. With me is Jim Stamos, the International Vice President of Local 40, call it that for the sake of ease, Ron Bonner, the Acting Trustee, Dave Matthews of a new union which is attempting to raid Local 40, and he's local one of CHAW, the Canadian Hotel and Allied Workers Union, mm -hmm. organized under the banner of the KMAR union, of which Peter Cameron is the Regional Vice President, correct? Right. Correct. Uh, and I'm going to start with you two. In the Global Mail story the other day, it said that your union was expelled from the Quebec Federation of Labour in the 70s because of allegations of connection with organized crime. Is there not some basis to that in your international? No, there isn't. 
The, the, the use of the word organized crime, as far as I'm concerned, is that it's a racist slander against our organization. And because, like myself, if I have a little Italian blood in my veins, that doesn't mean that I'm uh, affiliated or with anything to do. Have anything Absolutely to do with no truth in any connection no with way, organized no crime. No way at all. Now, what actually, where does it stand now? Because as I recall the, some of the detail, you had the old guard ran Local 40 in BC, right? And then there were allegations of trouble, the financial mismanagement, and the old guard were virtually thrown out and Charlton and Powell and Carlson got in, right? Right. Why did you step in and impose a trusteeship when you've got a new reform group, nice simple woman like Joyce Charlton, do you accuse them of financial mismanagement? First of all, Jack, the, the, the trusteeship was not imposed. There was a petition sent to the general president requesting that a trusteeship be, and this is what happened. How big a petition? Oh, well over 800 members. 800 members yeah. got together and said, please rescue us from Charlton, Carlson and Powell. Is right. that correct? Right. And where does it now, how did Ron get the job? Because he was a member of local party before. Well, uh, the four top officers were uh, suspended and terminated. And I, I as, as trustee, have the power, and I rehired Ronnie as the acting secretary. Now, what were the major allegations against you? Did it not arise out of the fact that there was supposed to be some mishandling of a massive union management fund and that some of the monies had gone to pay somebody's legal fees in the United States? That was the original allegation, wasn't it? Well, the original allegation was a mysterious fund, but uh, we've uh, cooperated with the RCMP report, which has been over one year old. Oh, the RCMP investigated this? RCMP investigated on John Doe complaints that uh, there was some misdoing, and to date, uh, that uh, information or any charges emanating from the RCMP have not materialized. And do you believe there's any basis for such charge at all? No, there's nothing wrong. Uh, there's no mismanagement of the funds, and there's no wrongdoing of any expenditure of the funds. Those are trusted funds, and they're accountable. That was under the, uh, the old guard, you might say. Of any guard. Now, under the new guard, did you say that they had mishandled funds? The, the, yes. Well, they mis they, the, the, the mis it was the mismanagement of funds. How much involved in mismanagement? Well, in the course of 11 months, over $300,000. Improperly spent? Yes. What way was it improperly spent? Giving too many jobs for their friends or what? Well, there was uh, mismanagement with regard to the, the expertise, the hired expertise where they should have been able to handle it themselves. Uh, lawyer's fees were excessive, uh, computer fees were excessive, the hiring of other uh, business agents uh, in a time of, of recession. Uh, in general, the, the... So that was why you stepped in on the petition for me and the members and said, we are seizing the funds. Yes. Also, you must remember, uh, when the general president did make his decision, it was for the welfare of the members of Local 40. Right. Because it was going down this way. That's his arbitrary. Right. He has the power under the international constitution to do that. That's right. Don't you feel nervous doing that, though? Here's a local which has just got a reform movement. All of a sudden, the heavies come in from the east and seize everything. No. Here is Dave Matthews. You're the guy that started all the trouble. Now, is there anything really, basically, is what I'm told here what you would agree with? No, no. Dave Matthews of Chaw, yeah. C-H-A-W. Right. No, there's... Why did you defect from Local 40? <coughs> because of the uh, serious, undemocratic, and dictatorial, and underhanded practices that were going on in Local 40. Okay, back that up. And um, we had uh, our elections uh, were a, a sham. Uh, the, uh, uh, if it hadn't been for the media coverage that we received last year and the, and, uh, the lawyers that we hired to, to ensure that we, that democratic process went through, we would have never gotten a, demo, uh, an, a fair election last year. Which elections were a sham? The ones where Charlton and Powell and Carlson were elected? Right. I thought they were on your side. Well, we supported uh, Joyce Charlton and Viola Powell last year on the basis that they would go through with the basic reforms that we'd been asking for for a considerable period of time. And of course, all these attempts at uh, changing the bylaws, I mean, all we tried to do was to institute the slightest bit of, of uh, reform in the local so that we could have, uh, this was, I'm referring to the three-year elections that we were attempting to get, which is standard in the United States, by the way, and most other local uh, unions in the, in, the pro in the country have at least uh, uh, two or three-year elections. And we were just trying to change that, and our every attempts at doing that were, sti were stifled by the officers of Local 40. This is you as one of the rank and file members. Yes. What particular change did you want that you'd say was underhanded or a sham? Because maybe they can answer it here and now. Well, in keeping with the 
uh, Union Local 40's bylaws. You see, to change any of the bylaws or the constitute, you have to you have to get a petition of 250 signatures, okay, to institute those changes. So. Uh, we and a, and a reform group that was established a year ago, or a little over a year ago now, um, went out and got the 250 signatures, uh, put, the, put the whole thing together, okay, in, in a proper fashion, in, cons in consultation with a lawyer, and uh, presented it to the officers of Local 40. And they denied it? Oh, they just chucked it in the garbage. Chuck oh, it in the garbage? That's wrong. That, those petitions for change in the bylaws were under consideration, they're still under consideration for change. They were uh, duly constituted under the bylaws and are going to be given every consideration. All right, now, but what about your allegations in this hotel fund which caused a few eyebrows to raise? Well, you, you were wrong in that, and there was nothing improper in that, eh? Well, that, that whole issue is currently before the, uh, the Crown Prosecutor. Uh, Not CMP but, investigation, he said, for a yeah, year. Yes. Nothing's coming. Well, that's, that's common. I mean, as far as that sort of an investigation is concerned, the RCMP, when they went in to, to investigate the fund, you know, were under the impression that all they had to do was to look at the one particular fund. But once they got going at it, it took them, two of them, over a year to look through all the papers. And, and um, they submitted a brief to the uh, Crown Prosecutor, you know, with a recommendation that, uh, that uh, uh, several counts uh, be brought against the officers of, uh, of you know that were in question what was wrong with this fund then? What well what's wrong with the fund was it a good fund it's good fund their funds mm -hmm. were for the pension the health and welfare six hundred thousand dollar fund or something oh no six hundred thousand dollar fund the funds uh the allegation of six hundred thousand dollars was uh made by came of money's going to the states not one cent goes to the states it stays in canada what do you say to that well that's that's outrageous uh, there's almost half a million dollars a year goes down to cincinnati and, but uh, that's I in your normal across the border per capita, I should presume. Yeah, yeah. It's, which is uh, routine in international union. Yes, it's about uh, three do three dollars and eighty three cents. You got the figure there? Yeah. yeah, about what three. What is it? Uh, for your information, Jack, there's not a cent goes to the states. All the monies are deposited in the Royal Bank of Canada, mm -hmm. Montreal head office, and here are the figures that we have in the three accounts in the Royal Bank. There's well over $2 million. Don't you pay any per capita to the states? The, the, it, it goes down to the states and it's re it deposited in the Royal Bank and what comes out of that is all the salaries of the Canadian officials and organizers. And if strike money is needed, also comes out of account. I'll give you an example at the Connaught Hotel in Hamilton. This summer we had a six-week strike and $50 per picketer were paid out of the Canadian account. Now, uh, Jack, that's that the kind of thing. Yeah. If I can, if I can no, respond no, I'm going to come to you in a second. I want to, I'll come to you in a second because you're the guy that wants to destroy them. You yeah. want to raid them. You have no affiliation with the BC Federation of Labour. No. Fine. The, right? Is that right. correct? That's right. The, the, I want to get your allegations clear that you think you can substantiate. Well, I did. I was appointed to chair a committee to investigate that Culinary Workers Joint Liaison Fund. Who appointed you? the uh, officers that were, the recently ousted officers of local... The reform group that got trustee. Right, yeah. Uh, they appointed me uh, to, uh, to a committee to investigate, okay, the, that, uh, the Culinary Workers Joint Liaison Fund. And uh, on, the on the basis of that investigation, we found that, uh, that it was just incredible, you know. What how, was the fund how, for? Well, it was for the purpose of, of, um, of creating uh, harmony in, in, in that particular industry, for bettering conditions for the Sounds camp workers. Good. And yet uh, we had all kinds of things like mortgages, uh, trips to Reno uh, for, to hold meetings. Uh, 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 let's see, what else? Uh, there was uh, $7,000 went to uh, Al Morgan, who wasn't even a trustee of the fund. That's the former president of local. 7000 went to him. He's not even a trustee of the fund. Uh, none of the, uh, the trustees of the fund know anything about it and know nothing about all the rest of the... What the, about uh, this fund, Ron? The monies that are it's not a trust fund in the first place. It was a fund designed under the terms of a collective agreement, the construction agreement. And, uh, Contributed to by management. By management and participated equally between management and, and union. And in order to spend money out of that, you had to have an employer countersign and a union, and it had to be a unanimous consent of all those people. Every cent spent out of that had an, the, the good wishes of the, of the committee. And it was spent with the intent and the purpose of that agreement. Now, uh, what about this? Uh, he was talking about trips to Reno. That's the kind of thing that makes an old reporter's eyes, uh, well, okay. eyebrows go up. We spent over two years on a, a redesign in the camp rules and regulations, and we had suppliers, and 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 were out of the country. You say it was clean. You sure. said the fund was good. Was that, were there any payments made? I didn't like the way you mentioned Morgan's name because I don't want to slander anybody. There's no suggestion that Morgan took that improperly, is there? 
Well, according to the trustees of the fund, none of them know anything about that expenditure. And, and was there such an expenditure? There was an expenditure uh, sent down to the states uh, and approved by the... Uh, the was that a proper of the, use of that money? Proper use of the money with, uh, and, uh, and had the consent position of all parties. No. Well, well, I have the minutes of that meeting, and it was not approved by the trustees. And all the trustees of that fund have been approached, and none of these expenditures that we referred to in a, a Sun article here some time ago. Oh, that's an outright lie. Were, Is that were, an outright were approved. lie? Absolutely none of them. He were says you're a liar. Well, I've got the documentation to prove it. Well, I can't make a judgment on the documentation now. I'll have to leave that lie. Hmm. Uh, what do you know about this? I, know, I don't know. Uh, you uh, you got to appreciate I wasn't here at the time when all this happened last year. Do you have similar funds in other locals across the country, hotel no. union liaison funds for no. public relations? No. Not at the moment. Now, here, you're the spoiler. Mm -hmm. You've really got no right to be here this morning, have you? Well, uh, we represent the parent organization, Jack. and uh, Who's parent organization? That's KMA. That's the parent organization for Local One, which is organizing okay. in the field. And as you know, we've been fighting for years to build a Canadian union movement in the country. And exactly the kind of thing we're fighting is unions like this one, which has been called in the, by the American Justice Department one of the most corrupt unions in North America. When? That, when was it called? That's that? very recently. I've got an article that's from August 82, Jack, that refers to the president, the person who appointed Mr. Stamos as trustee, as a classic example of organized crime taking over a labor union. What, are you aware of this at all? No, I'm not aware of that, but I can tell you one thing. I haven't got the article with me, but it will come out in the Chicago Tribune, I believe it is, last week that Mr. Hanley has been cleared of all allegations. You got to give that? If he mm -hmm. says that happened, I'm not going to call him a lie. Yeah, it's not illegal to have all kinds of friends who are in organized crime. You can have them. But from a point of view of a union leader, what do you think of a union leader whose best friends are mobsters? And that's the situation <laughs> with this union. Came out, of course, as a Canadian union, uh, and ipso facto, as such, as virginal, pure, and clean in all respects. Came out as clean in all respects. Well, at, that, at, that at, goes least, with at least when we have a strike, Jack, we don't have guns on the picket line. I don't know well, what that allegation is line? referring yeah. to. That's, well, the Indaco uh, problem, I guess, is well known to everybody here. Uh, oh, there was a lot of trouble in the Indaco picket line. Let me clarify we're, we're, one thing about a Canadian. We're, we're talking we've about been, a situation. We've been a chartered local of the International here since 1903. We're as much Canadian as, as any other people. We, we are total autonomous to ourselves, and we fight on behalf of Canadians. As a matter of fact, the policy that we set in here is sometimes an improvement to those in the United States. We've got the best agreements and the best conditions. You got, you got a yeah. trustee who is appointed by an American president who is friends with mobsters. You got a union and appointed, appointed, imposed, a trusteeship opposed from the states. You've got Canadian vice presidents who are elected by American delegates at an American convention. And they talk about autonomy. Autonomy in that union is a total joke. That union is controlled from the states. It's controlled from a head office that's on the record as being... Mind you, would you not say exactly the same about the Steelworkers Union? A Would you not exactly say the same about the Teamsters Union? The, well, about the Teamsters, yes. The steelworkers, we have problems with American domination. We do not have the mob connections that have been documented You'd by the American... You regard any union which is part of an international, across-the-border union that's basically venal. Well, there's degrees. Degrees, degrees of venality, and this is one of the well, worst. Hold your breath, please, after the break. Just for the record, there was a check for $7,057 in U.S. funds, 79, paid to Morgan, the locals then president, and currently the international vice president of Western Canada. And you tell me, and I'll accept it, it was for proper use. It was for proper use. Uh, and can I have a you can fight your other battles okay. in your investigations and whatnot. I'm taking Morgan off the hook now. It was for proper use. Now, what do you think of these people raiding you? Do we have any right to raid you at all? <clears throat> well, it's... The they're democratic right, if they want to. But as far as I'm concerned, they're not going to get it anywhere because they don't even have a collective agreement in our, in our uh, industry. That, and as far as I'm concerned, we've got the best, the highest wages, the best working conditions, and the best fringe benefits in North America. Is that right, by the way? Uh, for the, I mean, just about the wage. Are you well, happy with the wages and working conditions, by and large, in the hotel industry when you were a member? That's no thanks to the officers of Local 40, because last year's <laughs> achievements, as far as the as, as far as uh, uh, achieving those, the, the, the agreement last year was, was because of the people that were, that, were, that were on that negotiating committee. Most of them were also on the reform committee, of which I chaired last year. 
And the officer, then why did you go out the in the officers, street? Why did you go out in the street and the try to say it was the lousiest 40, agreement that was ever negotiated? The officers. Is of that what he said? Yes. What he said. You he said it was the lousiest agreement ever negotiated. What they wanted the the uh, the members of the organizing committee to take for the membership last year was ninety cents and a dollar and a quarter over two years, and they told those the, uh, the members of that organizing committee or, or that negotiating committee that if they didn't like the offer that was being put forward by the employers, that they should go and drive a truck for the Teamsters or go and stock uh, shelves at Safeway. Who and, said that? And that that offer was totally outrageous, totally out of line. The fight isn't over wages in this particular issue, is it? Well, no, that's that's not the issue here at all. But you'd say that he attacked the agreement and he was wrong to attack it. Yes, he was. That was the best agreement ever settled. Peter Cameron of Chemo, how much cash are you putting up to try and smash Local 40? Well, it's uh, reasonably, uh, we're running it on quite an inexpensive basis. We have an awful lot of volunteer help involved in it. So, and there's, my wages are being paid and there's uh, office expenses, but it's pretty moderate. What we're getting is besieged by rank and file workers all over the place that want out of Local 40. So What's it's not, your, not you difficult. A, you have a good or bad record in rating, haven't you? How many, many international unions have you successfully rated so far? Oh, I think there's workers in about 10 different American unions have left to join CAMA. But, uh, that fact, includes steel workers. Oh yeah. Who else? Steel worker, a whole variety of them. Steel workers, machinists. The two biggest groups are probably steel and the machinists. Until now, now we've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that are joining us, leaving this local 40. And you, you're quite. Uh, you don't care if the BC Fed gets smashed or hurt at all, do you? Well, the BC Fed. The fact of the matter is, the BC Fed for years has had a local like Local 40 and done nothing to clean it up whatsoever. But I want to get this point clear for union watchers. Kmo, the ambition of Kmo is to get rid of the, the BC Fed altogether and get all these unions out of international unions. Our ambition is to build a Canadian union movement in this country. We welcome anybody inside the BC Fed to join in that cause, and there's many who believe in it. Why? Sid Thompson's against you. Is, is Sid Thompson, my old buddy Sid Thompson, the IWA, sitting in? Has he got an office He's in got an place? office in our office, and he's there, there uh, with our consent and our, our good wishes to oversee uh, the, the trusteeship and just make sure that not, no harm comes to any member. Is Sid on your payroll now? Or no, BC he's Fed on the BC Fed payroll. And he's there to watch your every move? Yes. you got to say old Sid is going to do a good job of watching, isn't no, he? No, Sid's yeah. there in order to give a cosmetic appearance of some kind of something other than the crude American and trusteeship, which is the reality. He's playing a cosmetic role on behalf of the Fed. I'm getting the Fed tired of these racist wants statements. To hang on. Say well, that again. I'm racist. getting tired of these racist statements. Racist I'm a statement. Canadian, and I'm not an American. I work on behalf of the Canadian labor movement, and I'm proud of it. See, you are being accused of being a bit of a racist. A racist? You're Chauvinist nationalist Canadian. Well, you know, it's, we've got one of the few countries in the world where you could say we should have our own labor movement in this country, and somebody would say you're a racist. That's an you know, incredible statement. Every other country in the world has its own labor movement. You're a nationalist, then, I'm right? a nationalist, for sure. Well, this is the only country in the world dominated by foreign unions. I mean, if we ever, you know, if we as Canadians... That's not your fight, no. though. I mean, you're well, not fighting on the basis... You, I mean, if everything had gone your way, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have looked sideways at Cameron, would you? Oh, definitely, because the way things were going, and look, I mean, this isn't something that started last year or the previous year. This is something that's been going on in Local 40 for, for the last 30 years, and it's just that no one has ever taken it to task before because of all the intimidation and, and the practices that have been going on in Local 40. If he was such a, if he was such a good union member and he was concerned with the Local 40 welfare, why didn't he work within the machinery of Local 40 to cure that problem? Oh, boy, he was I given ever. every opportunity. Do you know that the man even went outside the, the terms of the then bylaws and was charged by the members and found guilty? So, I mean, tell me, don't tell me that uh, he did everything. He's a good unionist. He the, just wants to break the up trial a union. Committee, he the wants trial to work on behalf of management to break up at this industry. That trial committee that I was put before, that I was charged and convicted before, was the, was the most outrageous. I mean, if, if that ever happened in the civil courts or the provincial or the, or the federal courts, uh, we'd have had a riot by okay. the citizens of this country. Just, just to sum up for a moment, there is no possible way there can be peace between you two groups at all. No way. No, no way. way. You're the established old international AFL-CIO right. union. And we're a responsible union. We were here way before. But you do them. admit that you faced a number of allegations which have been perturbing to your members. Well, the allegations. How do you fight allegations? I mean, the, uh, tell me something that we did wrong, proven wrong. We didn't do anything wrong. Well, the members have obviously spoken uh, okay. in opposition to that. One last point. The, your opposition is now split into two. You're Dave Matthews. Mm -hmm. You're local one of Chaw, part of Camo. Right? Yeah. Why didn't Charlton come along with you? She's in a different... There's another group trying to raid. Who's the other group Brewery trying work. to raid? Brewery workers. Are they BC-fed? 
Yeah, the yep, Murray workers are, although the group they're supporting, we don't know what status it has, if any. It's a pretty mysterious group. How many members do you claim to have signed up? About 2,000. Oh, yeah. oh. Well, oh. let's say that up to yesterday, Jack, they had 700. The petitions we got from the board. 700? Yes. No, no. Oh, the way he's exaggerating. First of all, no, no, what he's talking about is part of the, the ones he's received so far, the ones we've applied for. We've got people all over the place, applications yeah. stacked waiting to go in. Okay, let's try a segment of phone calls on the local 40 Termile after the break. These gentlemen are quite outspoken this morning. There's um, Mr. Stamos and Mr. Bonner from Local 40, and Mr. Matthews and Mr. Cameron from Local 1 of Chaw. Are you you're working full time on Chaw now, are you? Well, pretty well. I'm about two thirds uh, time actually helping with the campaign, Jack. He says you've only got 700 and you've got to get 8,000 odd, no, 7,000 odd votes, haven't they? To get no, it goes hotel by hotel. Hotel Jack. by hotel. See, we've got already applications in or pending. By the end of the week, we'll have 30 applications in. Well, naturally, that we're will... challenging that. You're challenging we, oh, We've everyone. been industry bargaining for a good number of years. We're in voluntary industry bargaining, and we're going to challenge that. Let's, let's keep the call simple and straightforward this morning if, if you're involved, especially in Local 40 or Local 1. Go ahead, please. Good morning. Morning. Uh, Jack and guests. Uh, I'm a person um, who works in hotels and restaurants, and uh, What's I your question? to the union, but if I was to get into it, what would the union, how would the union help me with the uh, times of restraints and all? Oh dear, I hardly think that's a valid question. Nobody's going to get any wage increases next year, are they, Peter? Well, it's difficult that's bargaining it. for sure, but uh, we'll be looking for wage increases. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, yes. Jack. Mm. Uh, I'd like to say that those people that are there this morning from uh, Local 40, I think they're a total disgrace. And to accuse that Kmart fella of being a racist is outright disgusting. Well, that's your opinion. He objects to your attitude to Cameron. Well, you know? I'm getting tired of them you know, referring to me as an American lackey or Americanism. I'm a Canadian. That's what I'm trying to get across. I, I'm working on behalf of the Canadian labor movement. Are there any good international unions? Oh, there's, there's ones that Name are pretty one. good. Well, the, that's, don't put me to that, Jack. I yeah, can tell you a lot of real bad ones, I'll and this is one of the worst uh, ones. I'll name you a good one, the IWA. Not, not one of the worst. No, I should think not. Go ahead, please. What are you? Hello, Jack. That's you. Uh, I perceive this to be uh, sort of a political thing rather than mismanagement, uh, and they've just jumped on the bandwagon. Will you ask the questions and find out who's the communist and who's the middle of the rotors and find out just where they stand politically, please? Well, that's easy enough. I can answer that question myself. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm in the middle of the road. And what are you politically? I'm NDP. NDP, what are you? NDP. NDP, what are you? NDP. What are you? Same, NDP. <laughs> <laughs> Mind you, there's a big difference between Bob Williams and Dave Barrett. <laughs> and these shades may reflect here. Go ahead, please. Uh, hi. Hi. I'd like to know um, how long we're going to be in trusteeship. Good question. How long in trusteeship? Well, uh... I would say it would be between eight months and a year. From now? From now, yeah. Why so long? Well, we've got to get the order, the house back in order and get things on the road. What do you think of that caller? Well, well. Um, I, I don't think that's great. <laughs> I think we could get it straightened out sooner than that. And I also like to know, what, when we vote in new uh, president and vice president, will we'll we have new elections? Yes. Us into trusteeship Question. Again? Question. When we come out of trusteeship, there will be new elections, and I will be there presiding at the uh, nominations for the new That's elections. if he hasn't bitten you off hotel by hotel, you're going to be left with one beer pile and down in Gaston. <laughs> I'm not yeah. worried about that. <laughs> you're not worried no about that. No way. Well, as the acting secretary, uh, you know, we're going to try to get the trusteeship over as uh, fast as possible. I'm charged <laughs> the responsibility of getting it back in fiscal order, <laughs> and that's, that's it. It's, it's, but the person exactly. who decides that is the American president. That's who decides how long the trusteeship is. Who decides is. to lift the trusteeship? It will be my recommendation. Re uh, recommendation. Yes. recommendation to Edward Hanley, Hanley. the American president. Yeah. Go ahead from yes. Kamloops. Hi, Jack. Hi. Hello? Yes, yes. Oh, I am from Kamloops, and I used to be a member here, and I was absolutely shocked at the lack of uh, democracy in the, in the locals down here. 
I mean, we didn't even know when union meetings were being held when I was a member. And as a result of that, I quit and I decided I wasn't going to have any part of such a, a lousily run local. And I'd like to say to that, I don't think we should be joining KMAW. I think we should just kick the whole damn old guard out of the whole mess. Well, well she's yeah. with you, but against you. Well, we have uh, members of throughout the province, and we hold area meetings. We have a, 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 our own newspaper, and we post the times where the, uh, the meetings are held. You don't kick the old guard out. You, you, you leave the local entirely because the to all the affairs of the locals within, with under the jurisdiction of the International Union in Cincinnati is all controlled by one man, and that's the International President Edward Hanley. And he controls, and he the final say rests with the International President. So we, as members, uh, as members of Local 40, had absolutely no say. I don't even know where he ever got that idea. We uh, decide our own fate. And the only time the international president comes in is at a request of the members of this local. Go ahead, please. Go oh, ahead. Uh, Ron? Yeah. Yeah, uh, did you uh, go into the local uh, sort of as a, an employer of the industry, or are you one of the ex-SIU members from the East Coast? Oh, I came into this industry working as a bartender, and I worked in several houses as a bartender uh, over a period of time, and then I became an organizer and eventually an officer. Oh, okay, then you're not uh, in the same class as Rod Heineke. I don't know whether I'm in, in what class I'm in. I'm a, a class of Local 40. Go ahead, please. Good morning. I remember that name vaguely. Go ahead, please. Yeah, hello? Yes. Yeah, I was wondering, uh, I got two questions there. One goes to uh, to Dave Matthews there, and the other one to... Uh... Ron Bonner. Ask him anyway. Yeah. What's your question? Yeah, the question is, I was wondering uh, what kind of a bargaining uh, position he thinks he's going to be in. If he splits this union up into little pieces? Good question. Well, the bargaining position we'll be in, uh, of course, is the same bargaining position that really any local is in, regardless of the size. You know, the economic conditions will dictate some, you know, will certainly dictate as to, as to what we ultimately accept, uh, you know, as, as members of Local 1. But, uh, you know, there are a lot of factors that will be taken into consideration, such you. as the refresh, uh, re okay. recession and so forth, and the inflationary factor. And Just as a matter of interest to you, I had Adam Zimmerman on the day before yesterday, mm -hmm. mining, pulp, logging, oh, and whatnot. Yeah. I said, any wage increases that year? He said, not a nickel. It's going to be tough. It's going to be, be tough. tough. Yeah. But, but I'll tell you, it's the employers in this industry that want non-fragmented bargaining. The employers, remember, locked you everybody have, out. You, in effect, have industry-wide bargaining. We have industry-wide bargaining. Any breakup of this industry will play in the hands of the employer. Okay, let's leave it there. I'm grateful well. for your presence this morning, gentlemen. Uh -huh. um, John, Jim. Jim Stamos, International Vice President of the local of the Hotel and Restaurant Workers Union. Ron Bonner, Acting Secretary under Trusteeship. It's going to be eight months before there's a decision to lift it out of trusteeship. Then there will be elections if you survive. Dave Matthews, a defector from Local 40, now a big shot in Local 1 of the Canadian Hotel Workers. And the mastermind behind the rating, Peter Cameron of Kmall, who says he's got 2,000 signatures at the moment. In how many hotels? In, well, that involves any number of hotels. There's about 50 in total. We've got applications ready for 30. And he says you're full of wind. You've only got 700 and he'll challenge everyone. Well, That's we'll right. see. Next, John Sawatsky, the man who spies on the Mounties, after the break. John Sawatsky has a lot to answer for. Way back, some years ago, he broke a couple of stories highly embarrassing to the RCMP. The break into the, what was that, the Agence? Uh, Leslie du Quebec, APLQ. The APLQ. McDonald Commission was partly based on that particular problem. Then he wrote a book called Men in the Shadows. Quite a fearsome book about the watcher service of the RCMP. And now he's come out with another book called For Services Rendered, which swirls around the controversy over a man called Leslie James Bennett. Let me give you a wee bit of background, first of all. Leslie James Bennett was believed to be the central figure in a novel called I Spy. And as a result of that, the publishers of I Spy, who wrote it again, Ian Adams. Yeah, S Portrait of a Spy. S Portrait of a Spy. They had to pay Bennett damages, didn't they? $30,000. $30,000 damages because even though he wasn't named, it gave the implication that he was yeah. a KGB mole. It was settled out of court. Settled out of court. Now you've written a book on the same man in the shadows, Leslie James Bennett. 
and you, you know, the book is predicated. Was Leslie James Bennett a mole for the KGB? Was he? Well, that's the question that the RCMP spent two years investigating. They did everything. You know, Bennett was the head of the Russian desk. As such, was the chief operating officer in the security service. He made virtually all the decisions on whether to run agents, double agents, the whole works, whether to pick somebody up for questioning. And uh, in the end, they figured he might be himself a KGB spy. And they investigated him internally for two years. And he did absolutely everything to him. They bugged him, they wiretapped him, they followed him around the city, um, you know, hoping he'd meet a Russian intelligence officer, fill a dead letter box, um, fly a signal, all the neat little things that agents are supposed to do. They even mounted a closed circuit television camera in his office behind the pinhole in his uh, ceiling to see you know, what they could find. And after two years, they couldn't find anything. They did have some evidence against him, but it was circumstantial. And I think it was weak circumstantial. And the evidence on his behalf was probably stronger than the evidence against him. Now, we were nothing dramatic in this country, although this is a fascinating book. Nothing dramatic like the Cambridge-educated homosexuals who riddled the British Secret Service, who were involved mm -hmm. in big spying, big secrets. Yeah. Well, Bennett, um, you know, it's himself came from the Britain. And that was one of the reasons that they were suspicious of him, because uh, they figured, first of all, you know, Britain has been notoriously penetrated, and uh, Bennett came from GCHQ, and you've probably been reading in the newspapers the last few weeks about Jeffrey Prime. Of course, he was spying for the KGB inside GCHQ as well. Uh, Bennett was a civilian. That means he was not a Mountie, um, and therefore didn't quite, even though the Mounties were working for him, never was quite taken into the inner circle. Never quite totally accepted. But for people who might be a little confused, this man Bennett, Leslie James Bennett, was what number in the hierarchy of our secret service? Well, oh, he... Very high up. Yeah, yeah. He, his authority was actually higher than his position. He was a superintendent. I, in civilian status, he was a superintendent. That's right. Equivalent. But here he was, the top spy master, you might say, mm -hmm. in Canada, sitting in his office, and they had a television camera mm -hmm. secretly mounted against his knowledge That's right. to see if he ever put any bits of paper in his pocket. That's right, which was, it's kind of a farce because Bennett uh, had uh, virtually a photographic memory and he could read anything, if he was passing on anything, he didn't need to take it out of the building. Yeah, it's quite incredible. They bugged him, they followed him, they watched him, they tried <coughs> to trap him. And on one yeah. occasion there was a piece of evidence which fascinated me about a setup for a dead letter or something or other, and a KGB agent walked into it. Oh, this was in Montreal. What was this that? This was supposed to be the ultimate, uh, it was called a litmus test, because they wanted, they wanted to feed Bennett um, information about a phony operation that only Bennett uh, thought was real. And this was about a defector who was supposed to meet, uh, make a meet in Montreal. And uh, Bennett was deliberately told about it. And, uh, they wanted to see if anybody else showed up. There was only about six or seven people in the entire RCMP knew about this. And a member of the Russian intelligence service in Montreal showed up at the meet. But in the end, this was another piece of circumstantial information. You know, what did it mean? Uh, because there were five Soviets stationed in Montreal who were always, uh, you know, roaming around the city. It could have been accidental. It could have been accidental. It could have been a ploy to avoid the meet, mm -hmm. to scare people off from the meet. Or it could have been uh, the Russians learning about that from elsewhere and trying to throw suspicion onto Bennett. Okay, well, a little more about, just a little more about your book. Of all the operations that you go through in this book, Aquavit and Long Knife and Operation Dewworm and Tapeworm or whatever they are, was any of them <coughs> successful? Or were they all Not one. flopped? Not one. Uh, this is the, the big Our discovery that, uh, you know, if you go over from 1954 to 1972, every counter-espionage case that the Russian desk ran went down to failure. And, uh, you know, the Mounties, to their credit, have never claimed that they're the best counter-espionage organization in the world. You Were know, they the worst? Well, you can argue that. Uh, they're probably not far from the bottom. But, you know, and, and they've admitted this, and they've said, but we can't be this bad, because even bad ball teams win that's, a few games, and we're, we're winning nothing. Even the Canucks occasionally get into the Stanley <laughs> Cup by happenstance. But what you're saying is that this succession of failure and all these things did put a measure of suspicion in the eyes of not only his superiors, but his juniors, Leslie James Bennett. That's right. In fact, that's where the suspicion formed. It was not only the fact that all the cases failed, but it was the manner in which they failed. Because um, the Russians 
seem to um, know, it, you know, they didn't chop off a case. If, if they'd always chopped them off. Yeah, I don't know if we've got time to tell a story, but one of the most fascinating stories, and you broke it as a news story many years ago and documented it in here, was when the Russians were building a new embassy. Mm -hmm. And we, 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 were going to bug. That's right. <laughs> what the, happened? The Russian embassy was burned down in January 1, 1956. It was rebuilt in 1957. Immediately, the RCMP started plotting on how to get bugs into the walls. And they, they bugged the corner room on the second floor, the northeast corner. And uh, as the building was going up, as the building was going up, men would come out at night and push the wire up a yep. little bit higher, hide it from the contractors. That's right. And the Russians. That's right. And they, this was the latest technology bugs that the, they were confident that the Russian sweepers could not find those bugs. They finally bugged that northeast corner room. That's right. Did the Russians ever use the room? They didn't. You see, the Russians left the room empty. We were, we were bugging an empty room. Must have cost a fortune that operation. Well, you know, they were uh, having people listening to the, uh, the bugs every day, and they were just hearing echoes, and every once in a while somebody in the Russian embassy would come in and say, oh yeah, we should use this room sometime, let's, let's think about it. And then they'd leave away, and the Mounties would get excited, and then six months later they'd come back. And, would somebody, some, and that would be recorded and listened to all the time, the bug in that room. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they got nothing but echoes. The John Zawatsky, for services rendered. Bennett, as far as you're concerned, it's, you clear him in the book. Um, I don't clear him. Um, <clears throat> you, we just don't know. The evidence against him is weak. Uh, but in this, in this line of business, if he was a mole, he wouldn't leave evidence which would uh, stand up in court anyways. He'd be too good. John Tawarski, more after break. Most people have uh, an absolute fascination about the spy business, although I think we're all entitled to get more and more cynical about the effectiveness of spying, are we not? Well, you know, there's so much stuff that comes out about it now that uh, and sometimes you wonder how effective it is, whether it isn't just one big game, because, uh, you know, in First Services Render, I go over a whole series of cases, and non nothing really big happened. Now, these were the major counter espionage but cases. Interesting. That I was involved in the periphery of uh, the Spencer case. Mm -hmm. Interviewed him for seven days just before he died. He was a poor little man dying of cancer at the time. But he did, did he not do some, what would you call that kind of work he did for the Russians? Illegal documentation. He would go down the graveyards and look up names and then turn them over to the Soviets so that they would know uh, kids who had died when they were one year old so that the Soviets could come into Canada and assume that identity. They well, there was a time when all Russian spies carried Canadian passports. Oh, yeah. Uh, the Canadian passports were notoriously one of the most easiest ones to get. In Vancouver now is a businessman, a small, I don't know who he is, called, and he was in the Operation Aquavit. That's right. What did he do? He was a double agent. He had immigrated from uh, Germany had spied uh, for uh, West Germany, for the Americans against East Germany, and then the uh, Soviets found out about it, blackmailed him, so he tried to escape to Canada, and the Russians tracked him down and uh, met him in Stanley Park a couple of times, and uh, basically blackmailed him into spying again. He went to the RCMP, became a double agent, and um, he went back to Moscow, got training, a tape, and the whole works. And the funny thing about this case, that was one of the longest running ones, but, and, and when he came back from Moscow, the KGB gave him a pad for secret writing, and the RCMP investigated and spilled acid all over it and ruined the case. That's right. <laughs> he came in with his pad, somebody spilled acid on it, and he couldn't return the pad, and the KGB never used him. The, well, the, they were trying to set him up. They moved him down to Toronto, and as soon as he got down to Toronto, they said, go back to Vancouver, because uh, you know, they changed their mind. One of the most dramatic stories in the book is the questioning to the point of hot death by the former Canadian ambassador. That's right, John Watkins. John Watkins. A little bit of the Watkins story, because <coughs> Leslie James Bennett and another man were the people who questioned him at the time he died, and then there was an mm -hmm. attempt to cover up the specific reason for the death, was it not? That's right. See, Watkins, when he was ambassador to Moscow in the 1950s, he was a homosexual and had been set up and compromised uh, by the KGB. 
and then they tried to blackmail him very subtly. It was a, uh, it's, it's an interesting process. I won't go into the details here. How it's they, in the book, and it's good. Yeah. But he was compromised because he had been nabbed by the Russians as a homosexual. That's right. And then he came back to Canada, got promoted, and eventually retired. And then three successive defectors within a period of two years uh, pointed the finger at him. And finally, the RCMP investigated him. And it was Bennett himself who led the interrogation. And it was on the last day of questioning when uh, Watkins just died of a heart attack. Was that in Paris or in Canada? It, it, was, it started in Paris, moved to London, and uh, finished in Montreal, which is where he well, died. You're not known for writing sexy books, but there is one very funny story about the taxi driver. Tell us the story about the taxi driver in Ottawa, wasn't it? This is right, yeah. Uh, there was a very, uh, the wife of a KGB officer in, in uh, Ottawa was a very beautiful woman. And uh, she got, you know, interested in the uh, taxi driver, who was a very handsome guy, who was also married. And they had this hot affair going on. Uh, the RCMP picked up on it and uh, set him up in, in a hotel room, filmed it, filmed in a, a sexual encounter. And then there was a big argument within the RCMP. Bennett wanted to blackmail the wife's husband. Uh, the other officers in the RCMP wanted to blackmail her and try to get her to defect. And uh, just as they were trying to blackmail her, she got recalled to Moscow. And you know, there was a big question, why did she get recalled at this particular time? What did the KGB know about what the RCMP knew? And uh, he was sent to Moscow, <coughs> as I recall. They, uh, the, uh, the two uh, Russians went back to officer, the man and the wife, and this crazy cab driver <laughs> followed him back to Moscow, um, you know, got off the airport, uh, got uh, a letter from John Turner, who was his uh, member of parliament, an introduction, the, met the ambassador who thought this guy was a big business and he was just a cab driver, had dinner with him, and uh, it was only in the middle of dinner that they figured they were not dealing with a business executive but a cab driver, and uh, um, then he yeah. wanted to invite the KGB officer into the embassy. All right, where does the security service go now? Since the McKenzie <coughs> report, since the McDonald Commission, uh, and since the announcement, it would seem that we're going to have a separate civilian that's security right. service. That was the recommendation made over a year ago by the McDonald Commission and accepted immediately by the federal government, except nothing to date has been done about it. Um, I thought that, there was going to be a guy called Gibson, and yet I see, see a news story now that we've got a new spy master called Finn. That's right. Uh, Gibson went, went very quickly, and the reasons have never really come out. Uh, you know, there was some kind of a disagreement there. I haven't got to the bottom of it, but uh, he had a five-year contract. In less than a year, he was gone. And now they've, they've put this uh, very civil servant type of person in there who's almost faceless, and uh, uh, he's now running it. And uh, it'll probably be another two years before this new organization gets set up. Do you believe, along with Kelly, he used to be one of the big noises, uh, security service chief Bill Kelly, wasn't mm -hmm. it? That the McDonald Commission and the recommendations about the separate civilian security service has is liable to destroy the security service. Well, the short term, I, I favor a separate uh, security service. However, they're taking so long in introducing it that it's having a serious effect on morale. Right now, the security service is doing nothing these days. Uh, they're not even doing a proper job of following the, the guys in the Russian embassy. Um, you know, first of all, you have a commissioner in, in there who, who doesn't like the security service. But you mean Simmons from Vancouver? That's right. He's a policeman, never spent a day in his life in the security service, doesn't like them, and has uh, basically told them, you know, watch your behinds because anything you do, uh, I'm going to be on top of you. The other thing, of course, all the, the, the publicity from the McDonald Commission has destroyed morale, and the fact that the government is taking so long in separating the organization is also um, leaving everything up in the air because their guys now in the RCMP security service don't know what their future is going to be. And uh, they don't know whether the new organization will hire them, so they're thinking, well, maybe we won't go over and we'll just put back police uniforms and go back to the other side of the RCMP. Which they can do if they wish at any time. Which they can will do. Will it not also greatly damage our contacts if we're trusted at all in both Britain and in the United States? Oh, the sure. fact that yeah. we're taking away the, the Mounties as such and putting it in the hands of amateur civilians. Well, this is why you need um, you know, some kind of a transition. You, you need most of the people to come over because in the short term, you need the Mounties. In the long term... You, you will be better off getting civilians. But the Mounties already have some experience. 
Mm -hmm. But surely they can do the watching service easily enough, and I presume you merely watch the Russians to make to see if they're making any contacts with potential American spies, yeah, important but, spies. Yeah, but see, even the watcher service aren't working that effectively. They're, you know, they used to put little gizmos on Soviet cars so that they could help them. You know, with little bleepers, they could help them follow around. And they've taken now, because of the commissioner's orders, this stuff so literally that they're not even doing this. Because they used to have deals with the, uh, the service stations when they, you know, the Russians would change the oil in their car. They'd put these things on. They're not doing that anymore. And uh, Did John Zawatsky tell me that Canada really, are the effectiveness of the Canadian security is now down the tube? Right now. If, if you're the KGB and you're operating against Canada, you've never had it better than right now. More with John Zawatsky. Nothing but good news this morning. That doesn't really matter anyway. After the break. John Sawatsky, you spend your life investigating the RCMP. I've spent the last six years, and it's been the most, the six most interesting years of my life. I'm not about to ask you where or how you get your material, but obviously there are all kinds of leaks within the RCMP to Sawatsky, that's for sure. Well, I've, you know, I never Your misrepresent myself. Your phone is all the time. Uh, I just go up to them and say who I am and what I'm doing, never misrepresent myself or my views. And uh, a lot of them are only too eager to talk to me. You know, they've, they've gone through their uh, career, they have interesting stories to tell, and they're kind of just waiting for a reporter to come by and uh, tap them. You tell a story in the book about a man called Longknife, and I see after your book came out, he surfaced, his name was given, and the poor guy is humiliated once again, I suppose, the rest of his days. That was a kind of laughable operation, Long Knife. When I saw that Long Knife had said, yes, I was, in effect, a traitor to the country, after reading your book, I didn't really think he was a traitor. I thought he was a poor little soul. Well, he was a guy... Tell the story. The only Mountie <coughs> that ever defected, is that correct? Uh, the, the only one we know of, that's for sure. Um, Long I lo Knife... I uh, love your caution. Here my. <laughs> Taking it for fact that only one ever acted as a Russian agent. That's right. And you say the only one we know. Yeah. Long Knife um, was, oh. a, was a big spender. Uh, you know, at the time when uh, most Mounties couldn't afford Chevrolets, he was ri riding around in a big Buick. And he lived in a big house and uh, sailed a yacht, his father-in-law's yacht. His father-in-law was a British naval commander. Uh, smoked big cigars, wore spin pinstripe suits. This was in the mid-1950s when uh, the you know, Mounties were hardly living above the poverty line. So, needless to say, he got into debt because the guy was only a corporal. And uh, um, you know, he started borrowing from friends and that ran out. And then he started uh, resorting to check kiting. He wrote worthless checks and then covered it with another worthless checks, etc., etc. Till finally he ran out of all av avenues. And so he dipped into the RCMP wiretapping fund. He was the man who had to deliver the envelope with the money to whom? To the Bell Telephone Company. Because it was a cash payment every month because it had nothing to do with the RCMP's regular phone bill. It was for wiretapping. And, uh, and so long knife with the guy, square shoulder, big mustache, yep. as I recall your description, he delivered the envelope of payment from RCMP secret funds. That's right. It was around $1,000 a month. And he opened up the envelope, took the cash out, and put in a false receipt. Well, in two or three months, he was caught because Bell Telephone, uh, you know, as would be expected, reported the non-payment. Investigation was done. Only Long Knife had handled the money. He confessed. Now, at that time, he had some <coughs> contact with the Russians as a watcher. Not yet. Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah. So he followed. His job as a corporal in the security service was to follow the Russians around in, in Ottawa to see where they were going. So he knew who they were. And uh, what the RCMP did when they found out that he stole the money is that, the, first of all, they kicked him out of the security service, back to the police side of the force, transferred him to Manitoba, uh, which is all, you know, good, except they gave him an ultimatum. You got one week to replace the money, and that was the crucial mistake because he had nowhere to go for so the money. So he went to Russians. That's right, because it was $2,000, which is about half a year's salary at that time. And he said uh, I'll, to the Russians, I'll give you money, uh, I'll give you information if you give me money. Well, the deal was made, and uh, the RCMP's biggest case they ever had to this date was Operation Keystone with a double agent Gideon, uh, who was a KGB intelligence officer who had defected to the RCMP. Just at that time, as Long Knife was selling him out, uh, Gideon was uh, scheduled to go back to Moscow for a routine briefing, visiting his family, all this kind of stuff. He's supposed to be back to Canada in about two months. 
Well, you know, this was the last we've ever heard of, of Gideon. He was also supposed to bring a high-speed transmitter. That was another one that vanished because of parallel yep. circumstances. Yep. In this case, Long Knife might have been the possible suspect. That's right. Because he and, came back and tried to be a double agent for the Mounties. Um, Long Knife did, yeah. And, uh, well, what happened? Okay, Long Knife got the money, but of course he ran into debt again. And by this time he was out in Manitoba doing police work. And the and Russians he, were fed <clears throat> up with him. And he kept flying back to Ottawa, talking to his old buddies in the security service, seeing what new information he could get, and then running over to the Russians. Was he not the man who at one time mysteriously appeared inside Bennett's house? That's right. Uh, and did Bennett not w once have a vague connection with Philby? That's right. Uh, uh, Bennett was posted to Istanbul, Turkey in 1946 and 1947 and exactly the same time that Philby was posted there. They were both posted by the British, but from different organizations. And uh, they knew each other there. Philby was big though, and Bennett was... Philby was the station chief of MI6, and uh, Bennett was the, uh, the head of uh, GCHQ there. You know, he was the guy and who was it, listening to Soviet to, signals. To be fully fair to Bennett, in no way, shape or form was he ever actually connected with Philby. No, they didn't... they could find him. They didn't really work together. What... Uh, you know, you know, this became a perception in people's mind that he knew Philby. Therefore, you know, there, there had to be something unsavory about it. And, uh, you know, I say, what does it mean? Uh, the only part where it becomes interesting is that you know, later on, Bennett downplayed the fact that he had ever met or known Philby. And then later when he was being interrogated, uh, he said, well, I did tell all kinds of people. And he, he mentioned names. And the RCMP went to these people and said, did Bennett ever uh, talk about knowing Philby? And they denied it. God, you got to watch, you got to watch me too. Read these books and you become paranoid. <laughs> Good book, John. John Tawatsky used to be a common reporter on the Vancouver Sun many years ago. Now a distinguished national author. His phone is bugged permanently, I'm quite sure. <laughs> you don't mind me saying that, it's probably true. I don't worry about it. They don't uh, learn anything from me over the phone anyways. My thanks to John Sawatsky. Next, Dr. Tim Johnson, Director of Epidemiology for the Province of British Columbia, and that's a mouthful. After the break. I'm a campaigner for young mothers and families to know nowadays that many, many people have slipped on their vaccination. And if you haven't seen the ravages of diphtheria, or measles, or scarlet fever, or all these kind of things, whooping cough, you might not realize the need for vaccination. Now, I say that in the face of Dr. Uh, Tim John Stone, who is the Director of Epidemiology for the province of BC. Did I say a right thing just now? Well, we're all in favor of immunizing the children. And in British Columbia, we believe we can do this by voluntary means, and that there's no need for compulsion. What do you mean, no need for compulsion? People won't do it unless you... Some Vancouver City Council seems to have taken an admirable stand by saying, in effect, it's compulsory. And if you do not conform to our code, your child may be excluded from school for certain periods during outbreaks or until you sign the certificate. Jack, not only do we have excellent immunization coverage rates in this province, but the best of all are in Kamloops where 98 and 99 percent of the children are being immunized on a voluntary basis against all the vaccine preventable diseases and their figures are not only better than v Vancouver's, they're as good as or better than any in the United States at this time. Well, in 50 states of the Union there is compulsory or near compulsory vaccination. Well, that is related to the fact that in the United States, historically, there hasn't been uh, government funding on a continuing basis for the vaccine preventable diseases. They have put money into one program, then they've chopped it off, then they've started it again. And this has led to their problems, particularly with measles. And the situation with measles became so bad in the United States that they had to make a federal effort to try and deal with it. I'm trying to think of what Dr. Kinlock told me about the frightening rate of measles here compared to some other places. I'm afraid this uh, is not correct. Uh, I've got the figures here for measles, and I don't know if these will show up, but you'll see here 
that uh, in 1979... We, we had 1,800 cases 1800 of cases. measles. In 1980, we had 227. In 1981, we had 50. And so far, in 1982, we've had 45. Now, if we didn't have measles under control, we would be getting epidemics every two years. This is not occurring, as you can see. We have an intensive surveillance system in operation now where we investigate every case that's notified. There hasn't been any outbreak in relation to the new school year, which would have been if our rates weren't, weren't satisfactory. And we have had no laboratory confirmation of measles uh, in the last six months in this province. And that's on a voluntary basis? That's on a voluntary so basis. So you really think, although I shouldn't cause a quarrel between professionals, that the compulsory aspects of Vancouver's system are unnecessary? They are unnecessary at this time, and I would like to show you uh, the situation provincially, uh, where you'll see that 90, 91, 92, 94 percent of our children are immunized against the vaccine-preventable diseases. Uh, more than 90 percent at the end of grade one for DPT, that's diphtheria, pertussin, and... And tetanus. Tetanus. And More than 90% at the end of grade one for polio. Yes. More than 90% for measles and 92... 93% 90, for rubella in grade five girls. That, is that where you do the rubella ones in grade five girls always? Yes. We, we uh, recommend that. We also give rubella now as a combination measles, mumps, rubella in the second year of life. So in effect, the children are getting two doses. Well, I'm doubtless. I must be impressed by your camera with figures, but the facts are that the consciousness of the uh, parents in Vancouver has got to be very... Uh, aware when they've got to sign a certificate. How do the other people get their vaccinations they get, in other parts of the province? They get them on a voluntary basis. In Greater Vancouver and Greater Victoria, approximately half the immunizations are given by private family physicians, half by the public health nurses. In the public health units which serve the rest of the province, 95% of the immunizations are given by public health nurses. And we have figures to suggest that it's in the public health units operated by the province where the public health nurses are, are particularly involved, we have the best coverage rates. Is it a time of the year or a time of the day or what for, for immunization and vaccination? No, it's a continuing process. It's up to the mother? It's up to the mother and we have intensive campaigns which are operated through the health units, both provincial and metropolitan. So while you're not knocking the, the Kinlock program, you don't think it's really necessary? I don't, and I would also like to show you some figures here uh, showing the individual parts of the province in relation to measles. And you'll notice that back in 1979, there were problems in the Kootenays, Kootenays. and Peace River, and some of these other areas. Central Vancouver Island. Central Vancouver Island. These have now been abolished because we've, we've had these intensive campaigns. And if you look at the column for Vancouver City, uh, this really doesn't mean anything. Eight cases of measles in, in, in a city with a population of 450,000 so far in, in 1982, that doesn't mean anything. When you say 92% uh, for measles, we'll say, for instance, that means willingly and voluntarily done by knowledgeable parents. Yes. All right. The important thing is that people get done. Oh, yes, that's the important thing. And we can achieve these rates by voluntary means, and there is no need for compulsion at this time. Oh, my. Really quite spoken. Now, hepatitis B vaccine is something which frightens me. Uh, a couple of years ago, I did a story based on immigration problems related to health, that health workers were greatly at risk for this hepatitis B, which is not infectious hepatitis, but serum hepatitis. It used to be called serum hepatitis. Serum hepatitis. And I was kind of surprised to see that the government of British Columbia is not taking part in its federal allocation of this new hepatitis B vaccine, which is needed, it would seem, by an awful lot of people in BC. Approximately 3% of the total population of BC is at risk of hepatitis B, and that includes three main categories of people. It includes certain high-risk patients, particularly children born to mothers who were infected in pregnancy. It includes certain occupational categories, such as dentists, physicians, surgeons, nurses, laboratory technicians, blood bank technicians, and it includes the so-called lifestyle categories, which is the drug addicts who inject themselves in the male homosexuals. Now, we have calculated out that there are approximately uh, somewhere in the order of 80,000 people in BC out of our total population who are in, the, in these high-risk categories. And that includes 44,000 who are in the health occupations. Mm -hmm. Now, we were offered by Ottawa a total of 9552 doses of this vaccine, which would allow us to immunize 3184 adults, call it 3,200 adults. Uh, now, there is no way with only enough vaccine for 3,200 people that we could satisfy the occupational groups, 
that we could satisfy uh, the lifestyles if we wanted to, or we could, do, uh, we could cover the, the patient categories. However, we're in a very fortunate position because the Canadian Red Cross Blood Transfusion Service in this province provides a special type of gamma globulin called hepatitis B immune globulin, which they provide free to the babies who are born to mothers who were infected in pregnancy. This is Dr. Stout's program, an excellent program which is somewhat unique in Canada. Dr. Stout's program from the Red Cross in Vancouver also provides this globulin free to the occupational categories who have needle stick exposures, who get exposed in the laboratory setting on an acute basis to uh, infectious blood. So the highest risk people are already covered. We felt uh, we wouldn't be achieving too much by spending very large sums of money, millions of dollars, uh, on uh, the, a good product, but we can't get our hands on enough of it. I want to question you on that a little bit. Dr. Johnstone, Director of Epidemiology, what does that mean, skin? No, it's the study of the factors related to health and disease in a population. After the break. Serum hepatitis, hepatitis B, is a dangerous illness. Yes. Uh, Most people who get it don't know they've had it. However, about 10% 10 10 of people who get it go on to chronic liver disease, and some of them may end up with cancer of the liver. In this part of the world, uh, in the Western countries, particularly North America, Western Europe, Australia, and New Zealand, it's not really much of a problem compared to the tropical countries, the poorer countries. That's why I came out the time before, because of the, the lack of screening of immigrants from Southeast Asia with relation to the fears of the dental profession and others. But however, you say there are now 80,000 people potentially at risk who yes. need hepatitis B, right? Who, who need the vaccine, but that only represents 3% of our population. 97% of the people in BC do not need this vaccine. Yeah, but I realize that. It's certain groups which are at high risk such as blood teams, resuscitation sure. teams, dental sure. surgeons, and all that sure. kind of thing. Now, maybe I misled myself on this, but I understood that this new, new uh, vaccine from Merck, Sharp, and Dome was purchased in bulk, that is being purchased in bulk by the federal government, and you'd been offered 9,500 doses, which you tell me will only do 3,200 people. And so therefore, are you not going to use this Merck, Sharp, and Dome vaccine? Uh, not at this time. I, I think I should say that we are somewhat conservative, and when new vaccines are introduced, this, we are assured that this is a safe uh, vaccine. However, it's incredibly expensive. It's much more expensive than any of the other vaccines we routinely use. And uh, some years down the road, in the next five years, there are going to be so-called second-generation vaccines, which are going to be much cheaper. Right now, in the United States, there are five research teams producing improved vaccines. There's a group in San Francisco right now which is experimenting with chimpanzees and they have got a new type of hepatitis B vaccine which if it passes all the tests and gets uh, accepted will be much cheaper than this product and right. then we can get into a program. In other words, um, in the meantime we are protecting the high-risk people with this gamma globulin material from the Red Cross. Yes, the Red Cross are preparing this special type of gamma globulin and are providing it free. And this will be given to all those who ask for it, who are at risk. It is given to the babies who are born, to mothers who are infected uh, in pregnancy. It is given to the occupational groups whose blood tests are negative and who are exposed to infectious hepatitis B material. And but the Red Cross naturally wants to have documentation that the people uh, have no antibodies and that the material they're exposed to is infectious. So we won't be, if, if I were a, were a hospital worker or a dentist and I wanted the Merck Sharp and Dome vaccine, can I get it? You can go to your physician and you can purchase it and get it uh, for a large sum of money. And Merck is, is currently offering it uh, on a single vial for one person, $145.42. There would be a pharmaceutical fee yeah. attached to that. Uh, two vials or more, the, the cost is slightly less. But these are very large sums of money. And you need three shots of this stuff? You need three shots over a six-month period. And in order to make an impact on hepatitis B infection, we would have to have all these people covered. And then we might get a 60% reduction in the morbidity associated with this disease. One document I read was kind of left me with the impression, which perhaps you can disabuse me of, that we were just turning down this vaccine at a cost of $300,000, even though it was the best protection. No, we're not unique here. Uh, you'll be interested to know that the province of Quebec 
uh, and their Ministry of Health has exactly the same attitude as the Ministry of Health of BC. Uh, several of the other provinces in Canada are only purchasing token amounts of this vaccine. The province of Alberta at this time mm -hmm. is only committed to 2,500 doses. The only province uh, which is buying large amounts of the vaccine is the province of Ontario. And although they have been offered 30,000 doses, uh, they have only put in orders, uh, we understand, for 15,000. So as not to cause alarm or confusion in the minds of any mothers, uh, hepatitis B vaccine should be given to those who are at high risk, which includes uh, the mothers or infants. The infants, the Red Cross screens all the bloods uh, from the newborn babies, and it then offers this uh, product free. Should people getting blood transfusions be protected with a hepatitis B vaccine? Uh, no. Uh, the way that works, Jack, is the, blood, uh, the Red Cross screens all the blood uh, for donation in this province. And it's clean. And it's clean. There is no hepatitis B in any of the blood which is being transfused or donated. One here. New admissions to institutions for the mentally retarded. Uh, at the moment, we're doing studies to try and find out uh, accurately how many of those there are. Uh, we have certain figures, uh, but we're working with some of the people in that area to find out how many people are at risk. And practicing homosexuals and drug addicts would be advised to be covered by the hepatitis B vaccine, is that correct? Well, this is uh, something that they would like, may like to consider. However, many of them already have antibodies because they have already contracted this disease, and so they should have a blood test before they get the vaccine. One last question. Can you become a permanent carrier or not when you get hepatitis B? When you get the wild disease, it's possible to become a permanent carrier. Uh, and there are certain numbers of those carriers in the population, but most of them have had, never had any symptoms. Um, Dr. Tim Johnson, Director of Epidemiology, who's happy and proud of the vaccination immunization rate done on a voluntary basis throughout the province of British Columbia and thinks he's doing better than the city of Vancouver. We certainly are. My thanks to Dr. Johnson and my thanks to Dr. Kinloch, and I'll be back after the break. Tomorrow, for sure, I'm going to turn my attention to this red-hot video business, this terrorism in the name of anti-pornography. And I'm going to speak to a number of women from these um, anti-groups, meet a couple of them. We're not talking about dirty sex, we're talking about violence in the, the most extreme form against women. And that is what we are protesting. And, you know, you can put us aside by saying that we're puritanical or that we're, you know, um, trying to uh, censor freedom of the press, freedom of the this and that. We are not talking about censorship. We are talking about um, eliminating the violence against women in every aspect that we encounter that. And the stuff that's going on in Red Hot Video is one more example of that. I want men to stop buying the stuff, to stop making it, to stop producing it, to stop making profits off our bodies. <laughs> Did that yesterday afternoon down at the downtown, down at the Carnegie Center. Quite a little discussion we have with 10 very outspoken women on the subject of Red Hot Video and anti-porn. Tomorrow's what day? Thursday. Thursday. They're on for sure tomorrow. And I'll be here at 9 a.m. precisely. <laughs> the battle over local 40 on Czech TV at midnight with Webster. Women Against Red Hot Video on Webster, tomorrow, 9 a.m. precisely. <laughs>